I am ready. Welcome, welcome on this wonderful Sunday morning. It is so good to have all of you here. Let's take a moment to ask God's blessing upon us as we praise Him today. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this moment that we can pause out of our life to come to You and say thank You for Your great love, Your grace toward us, and the wonderful promise that You give us of life eternal. I pray, Lord, that you'll strengthen us now as we have assembled here, that you would bless each person as we praise your name, as we come to your table, and as we allow your word to speak to our hearts. Bless us and guide us in our thoughts and in our praise and worship of you today, for it is in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Once again, it's so good to have all of you here on this a wonderful Sunday morning. I know that some of you were hoping that we'd have a little sun this morning. Uh, it it might have been a nice day to have been outdoors for our service today, but uh, it's a good possibility it could be raining by noon. So some of you guys that wanted to ride your motorcycles uh, changed your mind and <laughs> decided to come by automobiles. So good to have all of you here. Let's sing together redeemed how I love to proclaim it.
Okay, we are familiar with their song, Standing on the Promises. <clears throat> uh, some of you have a problem sitting while you're singing standing, but some of you don't have that problem at all. <laughs> so you may stand if you wish to do so as we sing together, Standing on the Promises. May be seated. We come to our communion time, share around the table of the Lord to remember all that He did for us as He came to earth, lived among us and sacrificed his life so that we might have the hope that we could be on our way to heaven. I'd like to ask you to stand as we prepare our hearts and our minds through a word of prayer at this time, and then you may partake of your communion any time during the singing of our song, We Delight in the Law of the Lord. If you did not pick up your communion as you came in, you may feel free to do that as we sing our song. And then anytime you feel free to partake of your communion during the singing of that song, you may do so. Let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, for our missionaries who work so hard to spread your gospel. We pray that the training of Christ's Christian servants will be successful in carrying on the teaching of Christianity throughout our whole world. Thank you, Lord, for your Bible, and we pray that it will be the center of our lives and that we not only read it, but do what it says. We pray that America's people will vote for leaders who believe that we don't have the right to take the lives of the preborn and newborn. Jesus, we pray that the interest in such movies as The Chosen and the Jesus Revolution among some of our college students will not just be in passing, 
but the beginning of a new Christian revival for, for everyone. <clears throat> Lord, we pray that all the victims of natural disasters and war will turn to you for guidance and comfort. Thank you, Jesus, for your ultimate sacrifice on Calvary and for your grace and forgiveness that you have paid for with your body and blood. Thank you for this special message we will hear today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 seated. We've had the wonderful privilege of 
sharing with Joe Grana from Hope International University, one of our mission projects a couple of weeks ago, from Dave Sockins, our missionary around the world and especially in, in Mexico. Uh, Dave Sockins preached for us last week. We also support uh, a missionary in Northern Africa. His exact location is unknown to even us because of security reasons. And uh, Jordan and Michelle Berry are ministering somewhere in Northern Africa among the the uh, Muslim communities and uh, he sent us a very nice video I want to share with you. It's just a couple of minutes long. Um, thanking you for the support. And so I'm going to play that right now just before my sermon, Gift the Water of Life, There Are Better Things Ahead. Thank you, Norco Christian Church, for bringing the hope of Jesus to Norco, California, and around the world. Thank you for your support of our mission work. I uh, just think that as churches uh, go through time, sometimes we tend to turn inward and care only about ourselves. And I think that's been one of the wonderful things about Narco Christian Church is you've always uh, allowed yourselves to look out into the rest of the world and uh, have a desire to take Christ to places that we may not be able to go, but others can. Thank you for your support. So I come to the 14th chapter of the book of John. In my series of messages through the book of John, Gift the water of life, there are better things ahead. I, I guess I should remind you that it is only three weeks till Easter. I should remind myself it is only three weeks <laughs> till Easter. We, are, we have two more Sundays services here uh, and then our Easter sunrise service will be at 7 o'clock at Ingalls Park. There will be no service here at, at 9 o'clock uh, on Easter Sunday. Our service will be at Ingalls Park at 7 o'clock uh, in the rodeo arena. Uh, if you don't know where Ingalls Park is, it's at the end of 6th Street. Just go on up 6th Street and you'll come to Ingalls Park. If you just keep going and don't Stop till you turn the corner. You'll go right into where you need to go uh, for Easter Sunday morning. So uh, <clears throat> I still do not know what time we'll set up for that. Uh, I, I called Patty this, this week and she uh, <clears throat> was busy and said she'd call me back. She hasn't done that yet. So I will have to get a hold of her again and find out what time we will need to set up. It might be again at five o'clock in the morning on Easter Sunday morning, I don't know. Uh, so anyway, keep those things in mind. I, I point that out to you uh, because we are coming in uh, our study of the book of John to that time in in our study, although there's a lot that John puts in that last week of Christ's life. Uh, we have come to his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem 
And now Christ begins to preach some sermons to his disciples. I, I have pointed out to you also that one third to one half of all four gospel writers dedicate their writing to that one week of Christ's life. And that means that almost half of all four gospels have to do with the Easter season. Only about three chapters out of all four Gospels have to do with Christmas. And the last week of Christ's life on earth started with his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem where the crowds came out in large numbers to greet him with palm branches and they brought their robes to lay in the streets to welcome him in the glorious pomp and circumstance of the day. I often wonder that when they held the parade where they lay down the large palm branches in the streets and spread their coats for Jesus to enter the city if they had to get permits ahead of time. <laughs> or did it just happen spontaneously? Uh, anyway, <clears throat> I talked about that from chapter 12. And then in chapter 13, we learn of Jesus' celebration of, of the Passover feast with his disciples on earth, where he rose from the table and washed the disciples' feet and told them to do likewise. And I talked about what he meant by saying do likewise. At that feast, we learned of two newsworthy events, events that are about to take place but have not taken place yet in John's chronology of things. John lets us know in his chronology of the life of Christ that Judas Iscariot is going to betray him and that Peter is going to deny him. By the time John wrote this account, those things had already happened or John wouldn't have known about them. But John thinks it's important to let us know that Jesus, with his divine knowledge, knew what was going to happen before it took place. And now we come to John chapter 14. Before we get into the scripture, let me share something with you that will help us sit down beside Jesus and his disciples. It was three or four years ago that Danny and Rebecca, our son and daughter-in-law, went off to the Bahamas on a cruise right after Christmas to celebrate their 15th wedding anniversary. They left their two children with us for 11 days while they were gone. Ezekiel and Ezra are two wonderfully active children who, though they are both adopted, love their mom and dad a whole lot. At that time, Ezekiel was five, Ezra was three. Now I have to inform you that as far as I'm concerned, 11 days is an eternity for a five-year-old and a three-year-old to be gone from their mom and dad. One evening, about the middle of the week, we were having trouble getting both of them to go to sleep. I went into the bedroom where Ezekiel was supposed to be sleeping and he was whining and crying. I asked him what was wrong and he said, I miss mommy and daddy. Trying to relieve the emotion of the moment, I asked Zeke why he thought he missed mommy and daddy. He then began to try to explain the answer to my question by telling me that he missed the things they did together. I asked him what that was. Zeke said he missed going on walks around the block with Molly, their dog, and his mother. I finally got him calmed down and he went to sleep. The next day I took Molly's lead chain, put it around her neck, and took the dog, Ezekiel, and Ezra 
for a two-mile hike. And they both walked the whole route, even the three-year-old. After our week was over on Friday evening, we delivered the children, minus the dog, to their other grandmother and grandfather for the weekend. They took care of them on the weekends for those 11 days. Evidently, the night we took them over, Ezra threw himself on the floor and began to cry for his mommy. Now, the point that I want you to see here is Ezekiel and Ezra missed their mother and father having been gone so long. As they have gotten older, they, they don't have the anxiety nearly as badly as they once did. Later, I told Vicki, Rebecca's mother, that the next time our kids want to be gone for an extended period of time, that will be fine with me and I will gladly take care of their kids as long as that extended period of time is no longer than three days. <laughs> Our grandkids were a joy, but they were certainly homesick for their mom and dad. We live in a world where we often get homesick. We get homesick. We are often not sure what the problem is. We just know we're not happy. What the problem is, we are homesick. We know that we want a better place to live and we are not finding it here on earth. A lot of people are taking the wrong door out of this homesick world. But Jesus has an answer for a homesick people. Jesus was coming to the end of his journey on earth. He was about to experience a horrible crucifixion and die for the sins of every person who ever lived on the face of the earth. He had spent the last two years of his life trying to get his disciples to understand the purpose of his coming and how that would end in his death. But no one ever wants to face the facts of tragedy. As a result, Jesus' disciples were facing premature homesickness for their Lord. With that, we come to the 14th chapter of John. Jesus is speaking. Verse 1 says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Gift, the water of life, there are better things ahead. Three things in this passage of Scripture that I want to discuss with you this morning that assure us from the words of Jesus that there are better things ahead. The first is, I'll come back and take you to be with me. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me, in my Father's house, are many rooms. The old King James Version used to use the phrase mansions. We like that word. I'll discuss that with you in a moment. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. 
and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. I'll come back and take you to be with me, Jesus said. Now those are comforting words. The thing that we had to assure our grandkids was that their parents were coming back. Jesus wanted his disciples to know that he was coming back. I'll come back and take you to be with me points to better things ahead. The one thing of which we needed to assure our grandkids that was a mom and dad were coming back to get them. Taking them on a hike helped them experience some of what it was, what it was like to be with mom and dad, but it didn't replace mom and dad. For his disciples, Jesus needed to assure them that he would return. But not only would he return, he would, in the meantime, be preparing a place for them while he was gone so they could be where he was. Now, I need to take a moment and talk to you about the words of Jesus. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And now, this passage is translated by some translations, in my father's house are many mansions. Most modern versions translate the passage, in my father's house are many rooms. The attempt is to keep the translation more accurate. However, in my study of the phrase, I'm not sure that either translation is any better than the other because neither one really gives us the whole picture. And so let me try to give you, as Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. For those of you who still remember Paul Harvey, you probably are telling me your age. <laughs> uh, there are several words that we need to consider as we think about what Jesus meant when he said, in my father's house are many rooms or many mansions. The word here in the Greek is mone. It can be translated to dwell or to remain in the verb form. In the noun form, it can be translated a mansion or a habitation or an abode. Monet is a synonym to another Greek word, which means a place where one dwells permanently. Though it is not apparent in the English translation, Jesus is emphasizing the word dwelling to mean a place where one will dwell permanently as opposed to being a temporary dwelling. Jesus might have used the word epolis, which would have referred to a country house, a cottage, a cabin, or even a stall for animals. Or Jesus may have used skinas, which is a word that means a shelter or a tent or a tabernacle or a frail temporary abode. In fact, that is exactly the word that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 5, a passage that I often use in my funeral services when he says, Now we know that if the earthly tent, the skenos, we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house, a monet in heaven. And the word he uses for eternal house is a, a form of the same word that John uses here for rooms or mansions. In my father's house are many permanent rooms for you. What Jesus emphasized for his disciples is that the dwelling that he was going away to prepare for them would be permanent, not temporary. 
The important thing was not so much the emphasis on the beauty and the opulence of the house, but it was a place of permanence where we'll never get homesick. What Jesus was doing for his disciples to, was to help them look beyond the present to something greater in the future. So that when they were feeling lonely and homesick after his death, they could understand the value of his resurrection and look to the future where their home would be permanent and established by the power of God. Therefore, they need not be homesick. He would come back to get them. And what Thomas asked leads us into my second point. You have seen the Father, and you may come to him. Points to better things ahead. Now what Thomas asked was this. Verse 5 says, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, I don't recall seeing him. Show us the Father that we will, and that will be enough for us. Jesus had said, you know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas wasn't sure what that meant. So he asked Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Thomas still didn't get it. How could they know the way if they didn't even know where he was going? Jesus' simple but poignant answer was, I am the way, the truth and the life. And then Jesus emphasizes something very important to them and to us as well. He tells us, if you really knew me, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. The point was, they didn't have to go far to see the Father. Essentially, what Jesus told them was, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you recall, that's the way John started out his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelled among us so we could see him. Since we have seen the Father, you may come to him. And that points to better things ahead. When our grandkids became homesick, they wanted their mother and father. Even with that encouragement, Philip asked what ends up being a redundant question. Lord, show us the Father. And that will be enough for us. So we have Jesus' answer to Philip. And that brings me to my third point. You may ask me for anything in my name. You may ask me for anything in my name points to better things ahead. In the ninth verse, Jesus answered Philip, 
by saying, Don't you know, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father? How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Now, Jesus' miracles were not a result of his own special abilities, but a result of the Father in him and he in the Father. Christ and the Father, from the Bible's point of view, are one and the same. You might ask about the law of physics and say that two solid objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. The thing is, we are not necessarily talking about two solid objects here. And the second thing is that we're talking about the divine nature of spiritual things, not the physical. And so physics doesn't work. And then Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Now there are two important things here I think we need to consider. One is, anyone who has faith in me will do even greater things than I have been doing. What Jesus meant by that, it is obvious that we are not greater than Jesus. Therefore, we cannot do greater things if we are thinking of the miracles that Jesus performed through the power of his heavenly Father. However, once again, Jesus wanted his disciples to look to the future, not the past or even the present. I believe what Jesus is referring to is the work that the disciples of Christ would perform by taking the message of the gospel to the whole world. And millions of people would come to know who Jesus was. Decades and centuries later. And the second important thing is in verse 13. If you interpret verse 13 very literally, you may come to the conclusion that you can ask God for anything in the world and he will, or you have a right to expect that God will, Grant you your every wish. Now the problem we have is not reading the whole scripture carefully. There are two things that we need to read carefully. One is verse 13 that says, Ask in my name so that the Son of Man may bring glory to the Father. So God is going to grant you what you ask as long as as it brings glory to the Father. And the second thing is that you ask in the name of Jesus. But just using the name of Jesus doesn't mean we have asked in his name. Asking in his name means in asking in, in the name of Jesus means we are asking in his will as well, his will as well. I worded it that way so you could remember to, well, ask in his will. 
Often when we watch our grandkids, there are times that they ask to do things that we don't let them do. Now, Grandpa's pretty literal, uh, pretty liberal, I should say. Uh, Grandma's the literal one. My, my grandkids wrote a book for me for Christmas. Uh, it's one of those books that you do online and they give you prompts and then you fill in the blanks. And my grandkids said, there's only one, Grandpa, you're the only person in the world that can not listen to Grandma and get by with it. <laughs> My grandkids are pretty perceptive. Uh, <clears throat> Ezra, who is six years old now, is an interesting young boy. He is a boy who wants to do everything for himself. He ha and, and, and we commend him for that. He, but he is sometime almost unnervingly self-sufficient. Uh, he has been that way since he was younger than three. He doesn't want you to pick him up and put him into his car seat. Wonderful, I don't have to do that. He wants to climb up on the step of Grandpa's truck, make his way onto the floor and then up onto the seat. And then when we had his car seat there, we've recently taken it out, but he would climb into his car seat, put his own seat belt on. And if you did that for him, without asking, he would take off his seat belt, climb back out of the truck, get back down on the ground and do it all himself again. Now, because I always thought that was a commendable thing, I usually allowed him to take the time to do it. He's old enough now that he can do it pretty quickly. And recently we have removed his child seat and he climbs into the back seat, buckles his own seat belt, and he's pretty proud of himself. However, there are times that when both of them were younger, they would come out of a restaurant where we may have been eating together and they would go running into the parking lot where vehicles were backing out and moving about. And so there were times that they were disciplined so they could learn the importance of watching for danger. Almost every time we went out to eat, Ezra wanted to run into the street all by himself. And almost every time we would have to stop him from doing so. Now, both boys, as they, as they have gotten older, are much better about watching for traffic. They have learned their lessons pretty well. My point is that sometimes our spiritually immature nature that we have in our physical bodies may motivate us to ask for things that are not good for us. As we grow in our spiritual nature, we will come to understand it better by and by. The wonderful promise that Jesus gives us here is that God promises to listen to our requests. When our requests become more spiritually mature, we can know there are better things ahead because we've been protected from the dangers of the present. When we ask for things that are not good for us, how well our Creator knows and understands it. Gift, the water of life, there are better things ahead. God really does want the best for us. Our problem as a society, we don't want to ask Him 
for the things that will give us the best. We are selfish enough to ask for what we want rather than for what is best. There are three things we should understand in this great sermon of Jesus. Jesus promised to return. There are better things ahead. We don't need to be homesick. God has promised to hear our requests. He is concerned. There are better things ahead. We don't need to be homesick. We have seen the Father, and He is near. There are better things ahead. We don't need to be homesick. It's invitation time, and time for us to make our decisions for Christ. If you have a decision to make for Christ, we invite you to come as we sing together our invitation song this morning. I found happiness. Um, that song you will not find in your bulletin today, but let's stand and pray together uh, as we prepare our hearts to make decisions for him. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I pray that you will strengthen us as we share with you today, as we make decisions that will Help us know of the best things for life and that we might make those decisions to glorify you and your name. And now, Lord, if there's any here who need to come to offer you their life, that you might become the way, the truth, and the life in their life. We pray that this will be the opportunity for them to come. For it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
You may be seated for just a couple of minutes. I have a couple of announcements that I want to remind you about. Once again, we postponed board meeting last week to this week, so we will try to have board meeting as soon as we can after service today. Um, don't forget, coming up in just a couple of Sundays, uh, Palm Sunday, we're going to be having a potluck dinner uh, at 5.30 in the evening. Uh, bring um, a main dish and a vegetable or a dessert and your own soft drinks with you. Bring your own place settings as well and we will uh, share together a great time of fellowship as we set things up in here to uh, stay out of the rain. Uh, they, uh, the weather man, the weather people, uh, you can't say weather man anymore. No. <laughs> I, weather blonde, weather blondes and weather brunettes. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, they are telling us that we are not done with our rainy season this year. Let's see. The end of summer, uh, or the w end of winter is this week. Correct. Monday, correct. Uh, and so we start spring. So spring rains. <laughs> uh, any April showers? Yeah. Bring pretty flowers. Uh, anyway, uh, don't forget our potluck dinner. Uh, and then the next Sunday is Easter. I already talked to you about that. So remember that uh, that will be at 7 o'clock at Ingalls Park on Easter Sunday on uh, April 9th. I got that right today. Uh, <laughs> you want to come a little early and warm up? Bring a blanket and something yeah, soft to sit metal, on? Metal bleachers. Yeah, yeah. Set, sit on is always good. Yeah, you can ride your horse. Yeah, you can ride your horse. Victory in Jesus. Let's stand as we sing together.
God bless you. Have a wonderful day.